You guys can't handle this. You guys can't handle somebody who can actually be a social... You know what I am? I'm a boss. Can you handle a boss? Or do you treat yours like shit and talk shit about your boss behind their back 24 fucking 7 like friends? Holy shit. Yeah. S-H-I-T. Have a nice day while you are full of it, but you can't hear me say the word that represents what you're full of. It's called projection. Get therapy. I've studied it. I've got it. I've got social social workers and psychologists and all the... Mmm. Yeah, I'm allowed to have a passionate opinion. Okay? You're allowed to have a nice day. Try it, but you're not actually having a nice day, are you? Guys, this is a morning... Okay, this is what I do in private, okay? I think, wow, I really like this song. I really appreciate this person. How can I get them allocated resources? What are you doing? How many homeless people are you feeding? I can tell you your fucking names and faces. I'm feeding them. What are you doing? What the fuck are you doing today? Nothing. The same thing you've been doing for 20 fucking years. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to whoever's offended right now. Yeah, that's who I'm talking to. Guess who I'm not talking to? Everyone who realizes I can say whatever I want because it's a production. For entertainment purposes only. Get over it. Why yeah, forget the song? Just pick a song. Listen to a song that you like. And figure out why you like that song and not another song. Get therapy. Or ruin your life and live a miserable one. Stop trying to figure out who's the bad guy, okay? I'm the bad guy for not forgiving my dad. I'm, you're the bad guy for not apologizing to somebody that you hurt. Start there. I love you to life. You love me to death. You want to fucking lock me up because you don't want to get help. Guys, I seek out therapy. I sleep well. I eat very well. I write beautiful music. I write comedy and I have friends around the world who are celebrities. Isn't that ironic that some people are actually bad and they look good and they're free and some people are actually good and you think they're bad because you don't get therapy. And all you need is rehab and you deserve it in a safe, loving way. It doesn't take away your frame. Freedom. Dreams. Dreams. And then, understand I'm sober and you're not. You're confused. You can't speak clearly because you hate people who love you. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever thought the reason you can't speak clearly is because you don't love yourself and others? How well do you speak? Mmm, not very well. You sound stupid when you talk. I don't. I'm, I'm the woman who tries to get you to think outside the box and you want to put me in the you want to put me in the box with a man. Guys, stop abusing people now, okay? This is not abuse. This is for entertainment purposes only. If you do not like it for YouTube video, you do not have to watch it. Who's, who's, who, who needs help? I don't. I need people to stop hurting people so they can stop hurting me. Guys, you thought Theory is Scary was some, was advice to go hurt people. No, it was a, it was a juxtapositional entertainment purposes fucking only paradoxical campaign of the Got Milk ad campaign, okay? That's the Got Milk ad campaign did to me, okay? I don't want you guys to hurt anybody. I want everybody to get along. Can we get along? Can you be nice? Or do you want people to suffer? I don't want anyone to suffer, guys. I'm really willing to suffer for you. I'm willing to suffer for you. I'm willing to show you my no makeup so you can make fun of me just so you might listen to me. Guys, be nice, okay? You know what's scary? You know what's scarier than dairy? The heart that you have that wants to hurt people who hurt you. Guys, hurt people hurt people. Why don't you just forgive yourself and try to love people? Sing a song, go to work, be nice. And if you can't be nice, say something true that matters and then say, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that hurt your feelings, but I think you're important and so is everybody else. Hey, my friend just texted me and she says, hey, are you okay? I saw your call. No, I'm not okay because I'm not sure if people love me. I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure if people are willing to have me locked up or if they're willing to first try to say, what can I do for you, my friend? Why would someone lock you up, says Hacky, because they think that's best for me. Guys, don't assume that I need medication. I'll tell you right now, I need meditation. Let me try that first. Just, please, just let me try it first. Can I buy you a coffee, Eternal? Yes, you can. You can order it on Uber Eats and have it delivered to the location of my desire. And if you don't want to do it, I'm going to order you a coffee. What can I do for, what can I do for you, my friends? What do you need from me? Who locked you up? Who locked me up? Who locked me up? I'll tell you. People who were doing the best they could. That's who locked me up, okay? I was forced medicated because somebody believed death was best for me. I forgive them, but I don't want to do it again. This is sounding like a manic episode. Okay, Happy, let me prove to you that it's not. Hacky, let me prove to you it's not a manic episode. Okay? Hacky, how can meditate? Hacky, how can I prove to you that this is not a manic episode? I'm not manic. I'm inspired in spirit to be a good friend. 
It's not mania. I'm an entertainer. This is for entertainment purposes only. Gotcha. Guys, don't assume I'm mentally ill. Here's what I need. I need to have coffee with my dad. That's what I need. That's all I need. And if I can't have coffee with my dad, you seem a little hostile. I'm not. I'm not gonna touch you. I'm not gonna touch myself. Actually, I just wanna play my guitar, my friends. Call your dad. I can't call my dad. He's at work. He cares too much about other people to relax. He puts everybody else before himself, just like me. I get it from my dad. I love you guys, because I'm willing to put my ass on the line, because I just want to sing you a song. Let me get some clothes on, my friends. Now listen, I don't know what kind of situation you're in, okay? I don't want anybody to be hurt. But first, before I determine if you're a danger to yourself or others, I have to ask you a few questions. How is this girl by herself, Lorna? Because I called 30 friends last night, and I told them I just needed a friend, and nobody would come over. Because <sighs> they thought they knew what was best for me. Now, here's what I need at 856. I need you to let me go get a nice shirt. It's gonna be okay, I hope so, guys. Because I don't need the hospital. I think somebody else who might be having a heart attack needs the hospital. Guys, I'm good. Right now, I'm good. I'm not gonna hurt myself, and I'm not gonna hurt anybody else, actually. Unfortunately, I, I love people so much, I would actually risk my life before I... Guys, I'm putting my ass on the line here, because I love you more than I love my own privacy. Why would they not come over? I don't know, maybe they had an appointment. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. Nobody would come over. I called my top 30 friends last night, and nobody would come over. That's okay, guys. I love you guys. Maybe you're busy. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's okay. I'm not mad. Again, why didn't you call me? Oh my god. Oh my god. You are my friend because I lost my phone and I lost your number. And I have too many messages. I have a friend who just sent me a message who I can call. Okay, so send me a private message if I don't lose my Facebook account. Hey, my friend. My friend just sent me a message and he said, what the F am I watching? You're watching a girl who loves her dad. My name is Aaron. I love my dad. Somebody just told me he doesn't know, not schizophrenia. Hey, Amanda Haydar, do you have schizophrenia? Amanda Haydar, can I check your mental health records? Talk to all your friends and family? Amanda Haydar, to schizophrenia. Here we go, baby. Don't do this. Don't make me do this. Don't assume. Say, what can I do? No, I'm not on drugs, actually. I'm completely sober. But somebody wants me on drugs because they think I have schizophrenia when I don't. No one is judging you. Guess what? All my friends and family are judging me right now. Except for you, babe. You've got a friend in me. You've got a... Now shut up and let me sing my fucking song. I'm gonna go get changed. Because if I do it naked, you're gonna think, are you a fan of Trudeau? Exo Munzilla, are you a fan of your friends and family? Start there. BRB. Guys! Don't assume what's going on. You don't know who the fuck I am. I didn't say. She didn't fucking say, you guys. Hey, listen, this is Bill Burr, the stand-up comedian, okay? I'm Aaron Janice's boyfriend. My name is Bill fucking Burr, okay? My name is Bill motherfucking Burr, okay? I'm Aaron Janice's boyfriend, okay? My name is Bill fucking Burr. Stop fucking judging her. Okay, Bill, thank you. Thank you. See? That's my boyfriend. Yeah, I'm your fucking boyfriend. My name's Bill Burr. Have you ever seen my stand-up comedy? Fucking wanna go get a fucking makeup on and sing you a fucking song. Jesus fucking Christ, you guys. Unbelievable. Someone wants to know, are you okay, sweetie? Um, I am okay. Yes, I am. Someone says for me to get my meds. Please, Aaron. Okay. G underscore Adrian SS. Please get your meds, okay? You want me to get my meds? I have my meds. Is she okay? Guys, relax. Stop this life. Have some rest and meditation. Someone call her family. This is not okay. Okay. Medge Gardner 90. Stop this life. Have someone call Medge Gardner 90's family. This is not okay. Medge Gardner 90, I'm worried about your mental health, and I think all of your friends and family need to call you because you need some rest and meditation. Guys, don't assume what I need. Don't assume what I need. I told you what I need. I need to sing a song and play my guitar. 
Will you let me do that? Or do you want to have me locked up? Do you want to call my friends and family and prevent me from playing a song? Guys, I'm not going to hurt myself, Guadella. I'm not. Somebody else might hurt me though, because they think they know what's good for me. That's a topic for a video. I am hesitant to use the word paradigm. Paradigm is one of those painfully overused words, especially in newspapers in our time. But mental illness is really a very misleading paradigm. You know, and people are drawn to it, and people like to speak about themselves in terms of mental health and mental illness, and like to speak about others in terms of mental health and mental illness. Because it brings with it the pleasing illusion that the behavior you're exhibiting right now, or the behavior you're exhibiting in the depths of your despair, that's not who you really are. That's just an apparition. That's just an illusion. It's just a misleading set of behaviors created by these short-term circumstances. And once you recover your so-called mental health, right? Once you recover from this imaginary injury, then, then people will see who you really are. And that's, that's somebody else. Now, <laughs> there's always a crisis in your life. There's always some short-term excuse for why your mental health is not impaired, why you're not acting as, as yourself, as your true self, as this other person you think you are. But it's so much more useful and it's so much more honest to instead look at how you cope with those crises and say, this is who you really are. You know, and there isn't a contrast between mental health and mental illness. <clears throat> now, I think you guys are aware, I've made a few different YouTube videos speaking at length and speaking in depth about my old colleague and my old adversary, Aaron Janus. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not think Aaron Janus is insane. I do not think Aaron Janus has any of the currently fashionable uh, diagnosable conditions. And if you really look at the history of uh, the concept of being in a manic state, in a fugue state, in the videos that have emerged of her ranting in this way, I would not describe that as mania. I would not uh, describe that as a fugue state. I don't think she's in a disassociative state, so on and so forth. You know how I look at Erin? I look at her behaving this way. And I know how she's behaved. I know she's talked to me directly over many years. And I say, yeah, that's who she really is. You know, that's who she is. And I don't mean that as some kind of negative judgment, like this is who you're always going to be and you can't grow or you can't change. I mean it in the positive sense of that's who she is. Like, maybe you can love her. Maybe you can work with her. Maybe you can be her friend or your, her colleague, whatever your situation is, right? And maybe you can't, but you've got to accept this is who she is. These aren't extreme or aberrant behaviors caused by some kind of short-term illness that she's going to recover from. It's not the case that she's been poisoned. It's not the case that she's hallucinating because of some kind of drug. She doesn't have a concussion. That's who she really is. Now, I used to be married. I'm now happily divorced. Let me tell you. <laughs> I saw this and how other people treated my ex-wife, how they perceived her and how they refused to let themselves perceive her for who she really is, how they were kind of disregarding the evidence of who she was all the time. And there's always a short-term excuse. I mean, give a good example. Uh, my ex-wife got pregnant, had a baby. So I shouldn't say got pregnant. We quite intentionally had a baby. It was a planned and intentional pregnancy. <laughs> English language is funny that way. <laughs> got pregnant is a little bit too vague. Anyway, and you know, uh, I remember how she was behaving right after she, she had the baby. And there were people who said to me, oh, 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 this is postpartum depression. And like, I can't 
I can't remember ever fighting with someone about like I don't remember it ever really being a, a conflict or anything. But I'm already saying to people, what do you mean? This, this is who she really is. Like she's like this all the time. I'm, I'm being real. I'm not complaining. I'm not blacking. But like after she had the baby, her behavior, how she acted, how she spoke, it was the same as during the pregnancy and before she had the baby. This is the same person I've known for all these years. We had a long, very close relationship. So we lived together and worked together. Some couples, they spent time apart. But this is someone I really live with and work with very closely for many years. I knew who she was. And I felt like when other people were making these excuses for her, one, they were demonstrating that they don't know who she really is. And two, they were demonstrating why they would never know who she really is. Like she's showing you again and again who she is. And you're telling yourself like, oh, this is just a mental health problem. <laughs> like, you know, and, and think about the dichotomy that's there. You're imagining there are two different people. One is the person as she behaves when she's mentally healthy. And the other is the person as she behaves when she's mentally impaired. Now, in the real world, if you get bitten by a venomous snake, many, many types of snake venom will miraculously bring out a totally different character, a totally different set of behaviors in you. you know, when your body is fighting the venom, you're in this sort of altered state of mind. I can say when I was on malaria medication, <laughs> medication for, for malaria probably changed my personality a little bit. There can be short-term circumstances, don't get me wrong, that really do impair your cognitive function or change your character, or change your behavior. There are. Uh, <laughs> I'm not making this as some kind of universal claim that under no circumstances can we talk about a contrast between being ill and being healthy. And, oh, look, you know, I used to live in the tropics. I've lived in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and so on. You can have a tropical fever and just the fever itself. I mean, <laughs> you, you'd be amazed. You can hallucinate due to fever. You can really be, in this sense, you can have a mental health problem because you got a fever. You, you know, So you're not yourself. That's not your real character. It's not your real behavior. Okay. It exists. But what we've done is, as a culture, on a massive scale, we've adopted this unexamined preconception that lets us go around discounting the evidence before our eyes when people are telling us who they really are, when people are showing us who they really are again and again and again. Now, I had a whole bunch of emails from someone named Daniel. I'm just going to use his first name. I assumed he wanted to remain anonymous. And this guy was writing to me at, on the internet. You don't know what's true and what's false. I have no way to verify this. But he was writing to me claiming to be a personal friend of Aaron Janus and a personal supporter. And it sounds like some kind of counselor. Like he's somehow trying to help her with his life. I only know what he tells me. And I'm not saying any of this to ridicule him, by the way. To someone who, and, but on the internet, you don't know what's real. You don't, so I have no way to verify this. And he says that he really thinks it would be for the best for Aaron Janus if I were to delete these videos of her showing how she behaves, how she acts. And again, from my perspective, I don't believe Aaron Janice was bitten by a venomous snake. I don't believe she had a fever. And I've known Aaron for a lot of years, Danielle. I've, I've fetched this to you an email. All right, I know Aaron. Aaron knows me. You can debate whether or not I know her well. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, you know? But I'm telling you, you know, this is who Aaron really is. Now, he threw a lot of hypotheticals at me. Don't worry, this is, this is brief. I'm not going to... I'm not going to um, rehash the whole email correspondence. I'm not going to try to summarize and uh, and reiterate everything that was said on both sides. But, you know, one of his tactics was to say to me that if the positions were reversed, I would want someone else to delete a video that criticized me in this way or that showed footage of me in this way. Now, totally reasonable tactic from views like, whether you think of this as Socratic method or something, whatever method you want to call this, Alcibiades method, Thucydides method, why has it always got to be Socratic method? Aren't there some other names from ancient Athens we could use? <laughs> All right. <laughs> whatever pretentious ancient Greek name you want to use this as a method, that's totally fine. But I think he wasn't willing 
to really hear my answer. Because I answer, I took that as a sincere question or a sincere challenge. And I, I, you know, I answered sincerely. No, I would have valued this kind of criticism so much in my life. I would have valued this. So I still today I would, but when I was younger, it could have made an even bigger difference in my life positively to hear this kind of thing. Like, no, no, no. What you like, it's fine for you to ask this question. How would I feel if someone Christmas? But I'm saying, no, I I crave this kind of criticism, this kind of cross-examination, this, this kind of challenge. And guys, I was born stupid. Okay. I was born ignorant. All right. What you see on camera right now, I built it up brick by brick over years of hard work. I did not come out of the womb gifted this way. I didn't. And I was born with terrible religious preconceptions about the world that I had to destroy, supernatural preconceptions about the world and terrible economic and political preconceptions about the world that I had to destroy. So it's not just that I had to learn things. I had to also unlearn things. Challenge my assumption. As a complete coincidence, you know, I went over to Catherine Klein's channel. So if you guys don't know these names, no big deal. you can understand this video without knowing the names of any of the people. Catherine Klein, I hadn't seen her YouTube channel for a while. One of my fans sent me a message and said, hey, look, you should criticize what Catherine Klein's done. I sent Catherine Klein... And I shared this on Patreon. From my perspective, these are 100% positive, 100% friendly messages. But no matter how positive and how friendly you try to be, the reality is I'm communicating to her the point that she's talking about economics and she very fundamentally does not understand the science of economics, not at a high school level, not at a university 101 textbook level. Like, and I, as nicely as I could, I tried to say to her, look, you're actually taking political hyperbole and propaganda and you're repeating it like as if it's scientific fact. Like that's what's, that's what's going on here. I said as nice as I could. Now, someone like Daniel could say to me, it's totally reasonable. Like whether you think of this as Socratic method or, or not, <laughs> totally reasonable to challenge me and say, hey, you wouldn't like it if someone said that to you, but you're wrong. I would value that so much. Still today, today it would have to be in a pretty high level of erudition for someone to challenge me, whether it's on economics or ancient Greece or Rome. But when I was younger, I mean, I was as stupid. When I was 17, I was as stupid as every other 17-year-old. When I was 19, I was as stupid as every other 19-year-old. When I was 22, starting to get ahead. <laughs> but trust me, like I, 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 I'm cursed with a very accurate memory of how stupid I was. I know the extent to which... Some of the stupid things Catherine Klein is saying today, I said in the past, you know, this, the distant past, some of these misconceptions were inculcated into me and I was raised with them and I had to challenge them. And it would have meant so much to me positively if someone else, anyone else had challenged my ignorance, had challenged my preconception. If they had helped me, even if from an outside perspective, maybe someone would see their helping me as a kind of cruelty. Because some people, they regard all criticism as cruelty. All criticism is having bad intentions. But I don't. That, that's, I don't see the world that way. I don't see my, myself that way. You know? Um, so this guy, Daniel, has written to me uh, demanding that I delete those videos of Aaron Janus. And he's conceded the point. This is, I think, significant that my monologue, so me speaking on camera, what I'm saying is actually useful and is helpful, that there isn't something that needs to be censored or deleted there. He just wants me to delete the portions of the video that show Erin herself, shall we say, ranting on camera, okay? But what's so important with that, right? I'm going to tell you several things that are so important about that. The first thing I'm going to tell you that's so important with that is that's who she really is, Daniel. And I think that's very hard for you to accept. And that's why you don't feel comfortable watching that. I'm not saying that to insult you. You want to think who she really is, is another person, right? It's like if you have an uncle who's an alcoholic and when he's drunk, you tell yourself, oh, this isn't who he really is. He's really a nice guy. He's really a good guy. He just happens to be drunk all the time. No, no. That's who he really is. You don't have two separate people there, right? 
You know, he's your uncle chose to get drunk. Now he's drunk. He's a drunk. That's your uncle. You know, that's that's who he is. You have to accept that. Right. So <laughs> one important factor is just that quality of getting people to face up to this. And look, let me just say. Reflecting back on my marriage. Reflecting back on the numerous conversations I had with my ex-wife where she was screaming at me and being totally irrational and totally abusive, you know, nothing could have helped her more than if I had videotaped that. Even if only one other person ever saw the videotape, even if just the next day or the next week, I'd sat down with her and played the videotape so she could see it and she could see, hey, this is who I really am. And in her case, sir, talking with my ex-wife, this is how you treat your husband. This is how you treat a man who has loved you and supported you and has tolerated, endured a huge amount of this kind of abuse for years. And he sacrificed so much for you. And this is how you treat him now. Because I think there's a very real sense in which my ex-wife like couldn't remember that or couldn't see it with detachment or couldn't accept like those were really her words. Those were really her deeds. This is who she really is. And this is what I'm really, this is what her husband is really coping with, right? Seeing that on camera for the person themselves, Daniel, you may feel that that's only hurtful. You may feel that that's only harmful. I'm telling you, I don't see it that way, okay? I have wept on camera. If you keep watching my YouTube channel, you can see me break down weeping, Okay. Uh, my girlfriend and I have broken down weeping together on camera, actually, at least once, maybe twice, I forget, you know, and, you know, again, like, it's fine if it's on a kind of Socratic dialogue level of challenging me, it's fine for you to challenge me, it's fine for you to ask me, like, oh, well, wouldn't you feel terrible if there was something like you about this? But my answer is no, I think that's something that would be really helpful for me. I think it's something that's really helpful for my ex-wife. I think it's helpful for basically everyone I've known who could go through. Frankly, sorry, uh, I could talk about my own father here also. My father is now deceased. But it would have been helpful for him to see himself on video and to be, in my father's case, one of the main things to do is confront him with the extent to which he's lying. It's very hard. Someone who's a liar, a habitual liar, to sh to prove their dishonesty to them is very difficult. They'll insist to you. In my father's case, like, he'd insist, you know, I never said that or I said this instead. I had my father, I'm sure one of the times my father broke down weeping. I remember he always insisted to me that he'd never broken down weeping. It, like he never cried in front of me. <laughs> so it, it's psychotic. What can I tell you? Like, like, that's who he really is. <laughs> my father didn't have a mental health problem. Okay. That, that's who he really was. You know, um, he's someone who would lie to your face and say that he'd never broken down weeping. And he really, you know. Uh, <laughs> he lied about everything and you know it would be so valuable with someone like that if you could have videotape <laughs> and then go back and say oh no but look this is what you said five years ago this is what you said five months ago whatever it is and look what you're saying now look how different your memory of it is or what you're saying now can you see the problem can you admit yourself what's going on now yeah. um You know, we got to scale this up. So far, I've been talking about one-on-one, -on -one, face to face relationships. You know, my relationship with my ex-wife, my relationship with my father. And I don't know anything about your relationship with Aaron, Daniel. I just don't know. Uh, I assume Daniel wanted this all to be private. So I've been treating it as private. He now tells me that he is, quote, the king of social media, that he is, quote, a multipreneur. <laughs> That he's hired by big companies. I don't know what he does on the internet, but apparently he, he says he's a big famous person on social media. That's interesting to hear. So, and, and he's invited me, he's encouraged me to share all of our email correspondence publicly, which I'm not going to do because uh, I think that could be harmful to you, Daniel. And I think it could be harmful to Aaron Janice also, just being real with you. And also, I don't even know what's true and what's false. And what should be emailing? I know what's true in the emails I write. I can share my emails because I know I'm telling the truth. But, you know, no offense, but anyone can write to me on the internet and claim they know Aaron Janice. I can't. Uh, I can't verify that way. Okay, so 
so far, I've just talked about one-on-one relationships, including the unknown relationship between Daniel and Aaron. But we're assuming Daniel is some guy who is somehow trying to counsel or help Aaron as a friend. <laughs> um, Aaron Janus is a political leader. And she's been a political leader in several different movements. So, Daniel, I don't know if you're aware of Aaron's period of trying to be a political leader in the atheist movement, specifically in the anti-Christian atheist movement. Um, okay. Not just the vegan movement. We also have this example of the of the atheist movement. Now, you also have, you know, her career and involvement in, in music. You know, I'll, I'll just digress to say here, you know, I remember talking to Aaron years ago and she told me that she really regards Prince, the recording artist Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince, that she regarded Prince as a kind of uh, hero, as someone she compared herself to, someone she felt she had a lot in common with, you know? Um, and I didn't say this to her at the time, but I thought, wow, I wonder if she's like aware that Prince was this extremely eccentric guy, <laughs> you know? But, and, you know, also Prince was very messed up about religion, by the way. And, you know, but he managed to be successful. He managed to really get ahead in music, despite these eccentricities. I remember wondering, did she choose Prince as a kind of role model, as an example of someone who was a su successful musician while coping with, you know, um, eccentricities, uh, shall we say. You know, if you take the view that there aren't two different people called Aaron Janus, one of whom is mentally healthy and one of whom is mentally healthy. If you just accept all of this behavior as one of the same person and say, that's who she really is. Footnote, she can change. If, if you knew me when I was 18, all right, I had a lot of aberrant behavior at 18. It's disappeared from my life. But that's who I really was. I was an 18-year-old struggling with all the problems I had. And I, I did progress. I did change. But it wasn't, wasn't there were two different people there one of whom was traumatized or bitten by a snake or in some kind of altered state of mind, the one was, was the real me. You know, it's, it's all the real me. Okay. If you take all this behavior together, all this evidence together, and you accept this is who she really is. You know what? Maybe she can be a successful musician. Maybe she can be a successful artist. And maybe you, Daniel, maybe you can love her and support her in that. And you know, in a completely non-medical sense of the word crazy, there were a lot of crazy people in the recording recording music industry. You can be pretty crazy and, and you know, you can be very eccentric or a little bit crazy and you can do fine in, in the music industry. I, I had one friend, I'm just going to choose to not say who this is, and he was actually getting into radio broadcasting. Long story. He had a history of being a drug addict. And I remember saying to him positively to, to encourage him, I said, well, you know, you've chosen to go into one of the few industries where a huge percentage of people have a history with cocaine, like a huge, your coworker and your boss, whether or not they call themselves an addict or recovered addict, those people are not afraid of cocaine and they won't be afraid to work with you. So he was getting into uh, radio production, radio broadcasting, whatever you want to say. Didn't last. <laughs> it's another long story. What actually, what actually happened to that guy? Um, but, you know, of course, there are plenty of lines of work where instead being a little bit eccentric, being a little bit crazy or having a history with cocaine and that guy's good, where that would be a huge and superable problem. OK, but whatever you guys are going to do together, you know what I mean? It has to start from that acceptance of this is who you really are. And I think even that notion that that you can change, it doesn't make sense without first that that acceptance. Um, Aaron Janus has been one of the most famous, the most highly funded, the most influential leaders in the vegan movement in the last 10 years, to use a round number. Okay? Now, people have worked with Aaron People have started projects with Aaron. People have donated money to support Aaron. People have received update emails from her talking about 
film projects and music projects and political projects, things related to veganism. And, and by the way, I assume I could repeat all of this again with her involvement in the atheist movement or anti-Christian movement, you know, uh, you know, but I, that side of it, I don't know as much about, but uh, I have had emails from people who tried to work with Aaron Janice and try to support her and were, were disappointed because of her unreliability and her eccentricity. So, okay. So Daniel, I know you don't sympathize with my point of view, but within the vegan movement, it is really important that people see Aaron for who she really is. And, you know, maybe she can have a wonderful future as a recording artist, you know, as a creative artist. I'm going to know whether or not she's a musician. I mean, it's not the only role you can have in the, in the music world. You know, maybe she can have a great career that way, you know, <laughs> Maybe the world would be a better place if Donald Trump had become a game show host and had just continued working as a game show host. Okay, maybe the world would be a better place if people had known who Donald Trump really was and he had never made the transition from reality TV game show host to politician. So I, I'm of the opinion that Donald Trump is morally a bad person. And to say he's eccentric or unreliable, Donald Trump, how crazy is Donald Trump on a scale of one to 10? Okay. I, I don't think it's a problem for Donald Trump to be a game show host, for him to work in entertainment. I'm not trying to, to get him fired from that job. We're trying to get him banned from being a game show host, right? When Donald Trump made the transition to a role of political leadership, people really needed to know who he was intellectually, ethically, and emotionally. Okay. So, Daniel, I know we've had email back and forth. I know you don't sympathize with my point of view, what I'm saying here. But part of what I do on my YouTube channel is to look at people like Donald Trump. And to look at people who are less famous, but within veganism, much more important, like Dr. Gregor, <laughs> uh, Neil Bernard, Dr. Neil Bernard. These are just two examples I'm choosing here. And to say, look, this is who this guy really is. I've found examples of Dr. Gregor lying about what is in peer-reviewed medical research. And I take that. It's not to hurt Dr. Greger, personally, it's not to, it's not for some emotional or psychological reason. And I show my audience, look, if he's willing to lie about this, how do you know when this guy's telling the truth? Really think about it. Really think about who this person is. Neil Bernard, same story. I wish I could sit here and tell you I have a ton of intellectual respect for Neil Bernard. I don't. And I've caught him lying. I've caught him being really dishonest. Now, he may tell the truth nine times out of ten, but I don't, I don't know. And when you know someone's unreliable that way, you know someone's dishonest that way, that matters politically. It matters in veganism. And I would say, what if you were part of the Catalan independence movement? You were part of the political movement to make Catalonia into a separate country. These kinds of questions, maybe about people who have fewer views on YouTube than Aaron Janus, like maybe people who just have a few thousand views, it may really matter to examine who the political leaders are, who the political voices are, intellectually, ethically, emotionally. Say, look, this is who this person really is, okay? Uh, I, I've never gotten like a lot of email defending Aaron Janus. I've got to tell you, I, I haven't. I've gotten emails from people saying, hey, thanks. I really appreciate that you stood up and <laughs> said what you've said about Aaron after they had their own negative experiences with her. Um, but I know a few people have written to me basically just expressing incredulity that they can't believe this is who Aaron really is. They can't take my word for it or they can't take my, my critique of her seriously. I understand that, okay? <laughs> There's a sense in which I think 
my ex-wife will never be able to believe how abusive she was toward me because she hasn't seen it on tape. I think my father was never able to believe how much he lied to me because he didn't see it on tape. People lie to themselves about their behavior. People lie to themselves. Well, you know, I think it's very powerful and very meaningful to be able to show someone the recording and say, look, this is what you really said. This is who you're going to think. They see the tone of the, they hear the tone of their voice and see the look in their eyes. They see how angry they are. They see whatever the whatever the situation might be. Okay, so Daniel, um, I know it's inconvenient for you, and uh, you know I don't really even believe you disagree with me. I don't think you perceive me as crazy. You've made this guy has accused me of being a coward. Eh, wrong answer. Then he accuses me of not having any empathy. And wrong answer. There's a lot of empathy in all these videos. I have empathy for all these people. I have empathy for my, my ex-wife. Terrible human being. I loved her. I supported her for years. Terrible human being. I got empathy for her. I, my parents are both terrible human beings. I got empathy for them. I do. I know what's wrong with them. I know what's right with them. You know, we can, we can talk about it. With total detachment, I can say this. Doesn't mean I don't have, I don't have empathy, right? Um, Daniel, I don't think you actually perceive me as a coward or as a psychopath or someone with no empathy or anything else. I think you don't even disagree with the argument I'm presenting here. I think it's just inconvenient for you. And you're willing to say anything to try to twist my arm into deleting those videos. And I can empathize with your position too. But by the same token, whereby I'm here saying... Um, It would be so meaningful for any of these people themselves to see the videotape. It'd be meaningful for Aaron herself to watch the videotape and so on. On some level, you know, my audience would never believe me if I just gave a description of Aaron Janice's behavior. There is no way I could describe this in poetry or prose that would ever get across what can be communicated so effectively, so efficiently in just a few minutes of primary source videotape of this person showing you who they really are. And Daniel, based on your messages, you're not vegan. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But based on what you've written to me, you seem to be telling me that you're not vegan. You don't care about the vegan movement. You probably don't care about politics in Cambodia. You probably don't care about politics in Laos. You probably don't care about politics in uh, Catalonia, a lot of places around the world, right? I just want you to take a moment to imagine veganism as if it's a foreign country. It's a small, poor, powerless foreign country. But the future of veganism means so much to me. I care about it so much. And I actually think it's important for the whole world on the larger scale. And I think it's important for the quality of life. And for the meaning of life, for the meaning in life of individual people, like I think it matters on the largest scale and on the smallest scale, you know, so profoundly that, yeah, I think it's genuinely worthwhile to come here on camera and say, look, this is who you think James Aspie is, but here's who he really is, okay? This is who you think Freely is. This is who you think Durian Rider is. This is who they really are. Let's face up to who the leaders of this movement have been. People like Malcolm X, they weren't always famous. Other people made them famous. 
people donated money to support them and invited them to sit on stage. You know, today the process is much more transparent on social media. You can see the process whereby someone like Aaron Janis is plucked up from obscurity and someone donated a lot of money to have a billboard campaign. And all across Los Angeles, on huge billboards, was Erin Janice's face promoting her YouTube channel and her YouTube video. Uh, you tell me the cost estimate of that one advertisement campaign. How Erin Janice rose to a position of power and authority is actually much easier to say than the step-by-step -step process whereby Malcolm X became a major influential political leader in the United States. Think about how different life in the United States of America today would be if it had been someone other than Malcolm X who played that same role, who'd taken on that same position. I'm not going to digress here into the critique of Malcolm X. If you don't know, it's dark. Mohandas Gandhi, some people call him Mahatma. What if it had been some other lawyer? <laughs> Jeez. God, he was a terrible person. I'm sorry. Both regarding a religious sense, who he was as a religious eccentric, ethically, terrible human being, unbelievably awful influence on the political history of India. Both these cases, I know you may not have even read the Wikipedia article, let alone done research into exactly the kind of shocking and horrifying things about these people that are not in. Wikipedia article. Well, I, you know, even looking at Gandhi's sex life, you know, it's not, I'm not condemning him or canceling him just for that reason. That'll start to tell you something. I'll start to show you some of the cracks in the facade. Okay. Um, I know in the short term, Daniel, and you're, you're probably upset by this too, because I mean, if your emails are telling the truth, you're involved with Aaron, you're actually spending time sitting with him and so on. You know, I, I empathize. I do. You know, I don't think history is made by abstract ideas. I think that history is made by women and men. And visibly or invisibly, we choose who those people are. We place our trust in them. And the vegan movement has accomplished nothing in the last five years because we trusted the wrong people.